Hi, John. And welcome again to breakfast at Kuznach. Yes. It's really nice to see you are healthy and safe at home. First of all, let me ask you, how are you? Physically, I feel well and psychologically, like everyone else, I'm on alert. And yet somehow there seems to be a space, especially because I am what we call in San Francisco sheltering at home. Uh, I seem to have also a space, especially in the middle of the night when I can't sleep or wake up to sit with my thoughts for two or three hours and have the luxury of reflection. Mm -hmm. And I say those are my most precious moments when my psyche won't let me sleep, but also doesn't want me to think in a directed way. And those moments are very precious to me. We will get to they give me the strength I need to take care of the patients I see. I work usually seven days a week in, in different times. I I have a lot of people that I see around the world and I have a lot of people that I have spoken to for years only on electronic media. So seeing my patients also in San Francisco as I must now via electronic means, either telephone or as we're doing now by Skype or other methods of Zoom, uh, there's so many of them, WeChat in China, uh, VC in America, there's so many ways I've talked to people. I, I find it easy to communicate with people in any medium, and so I don't mind not having to go into my office. But if I didn't take that time to reflect each day, I think I would be missing the whole point of this time, which is it forces us to think, but in a very different way than we usually think. Yeah. Before to go in that way, to, to deepen your reflections, your own self-reflection, how do you feel these days? I feel as if we're in the grip of a gigantic compensation. Uh, I feel that uh, it's almost as if one goes back to the very beginnings of Jung and the very beginnings of some of the things that Jung was talking about, even before he met Freud for the first time. For instance, when he was still imagining himself to be a natural scientist, building uh, into the world of psychology. And he said, for all intents and purposes, in those days, it's hilarious to think of Jung describing him this way, but he, he really even thought of himself when he finally had the word, apology words, as a sensation type. Because he'd worked so hard to make himself a scientist that he was really a whiz at things like neuroanatomy and many other things. And he uh, he was doing research and he was wearing a stopwatch and a white coat and being a very white coated researcher, getting people's associations to stimulus words to see if he could map out their complexes in a very scientific way. It made him <coughs> famous. But he noticed that different people approached the whole testing situation differently. So as early as 1904, he starts trying to find words for this, and he, and he has different words. But soon he has the idea that there are very two very large types of people, or perhaps two large types of attitudes that people take toward things. And one is the very, very extroverted attitude, the woman who would walk into the test, say, oh, that beautiful salmon colored test. You must love looking at that in this office. You must feel so sad for yourself. Or, or the man who would come and drill and just listen to the stimulus words and go into his mind and try to get the exact moment at which the association appeared. And he, admit, he, he finally came up with words early on that one, one of these people was much more extroverted and the other was more introverted. That was the beginning. I mean, it was just the very beginning. Of, and it, he even wasn't the first to make that distinction. Uh, Binet had already seen it in his two daughters when he was doing the psychology of intelligence and had words that were very similar, externospection and introspection. But the, the major idea was there were, and did Henry, you know, William James had talked about tender minded and tough minded people. There were all these different things. And there were these two attitudes. Well, you have to go all the way back to the beginning to try to understand that the only reason the planet is heating up is that we're so pathologically extroverted. Living in a hypomanic country like uh, America, you see that it's all extroversion. So that now that people like, 
myself have to, and I'm an extrovert actually, believe it or not, uh, and I, I, I have to stay at home. Well, thank God I had 25 years of Jungian analysis, so I know how to introvert. Most Americans are absolutely terrified of being alone for even five minutes, I and mean, even I rarely do, can be alone without some media going. Thank God for doing therapy by internet, at least it feels extroverted, but with, in our country, it's so obvious. And so when, when you crash into everything, even poor China, you know, if, if this virus hit right at the middle, uh, just before spring festival, when everyone goes home, that's their extroverted holiday. Once a year, they go home and they are with their family again. It's a very introverted way to have an extroverted holiday, but they do it. And they couldn't restrain themselves. They could, the government couldn't tell them, just stay home this time. We will not celebrate this time. We'll celebrate in July sometime. So they had about a month late start because so many people went, for instance, to Wuhan, where this, the, the province of Hubei, where the virus started. And they saw their families. And then, you know, a million people went back to the rest of China. And suddenly the, the virus was spreading. And, and had they only listen to the doctor that told them in late December that this was coming, but actually temporarily they tried to censor his voice and the poor man, like so many doctors who are putting themselves on the line right now, uh, eventually not only was proved right, but very died of the virus. The doctor died of the virus, a young, youngish man too. And, uh, that produced national outrage, which even the Chinese government could not quell. They, they all, there was all, all, lots of people were angry and discussing what had happened to that doctor. So they caught on. But then after that, the Chinese were really remarkably good at staying home. And they really were able to stop the spread of the virus by flattening the curve, which everybody's talking about now. I think it's much harder for us in the West uh, to... Uh, retract our commitment to extroversion. And in fact, I come back to the fact that if we had only been in, in more balance all the way around, all these countries talking about growing their economies and all these people talking about full employment, it, 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 there's a sh the shadow of that aside from all the economic needs. We all live in an economic myth and we all have economic needs. Is, uh, as Wordsworth said so long ago, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. And uh, we really are being all in the grip of this violent compensation. Nature, nature is not a respecter of persons. It, it works through situations. That's what I learned from the I Ching. And so I, I would love to say that a loving God would not have allowed this to happen. Or, and I also don't wish to say that God is a vengeful God that's punishing, punishing us a la, la last judgment and making us do things. Rather, I just think that nature wants balance. And so when we're imbalanced in a, in a violent way, and we've been so violently extroverted, it's so damaging our environment and the con as a consequence. Uh, with our islands of plastic, I'm not even going to mention our wars, uh, uh, then we have to somehow realize that sooner or later, nature is going to compensate. And so it's almost as if we don't know how it happened, but the bats bit the snakes and the people whose businesses had to close in China because of the trade war Mr. Trump started with no good reason, in my opinion, frankly. Uh, businesses that people have come to have went back to selling on the street and as, as they were doing before that, as I saw in 1998 when I went to Shanghai. There were all these people selling on the street. Then in 2006, when I went back again, everybody had shops. Nobody was selling on the street anymore. China's economy was, was booming. And then Many businesses closed in China as soon as the trade war started. And where do you think those people went? They started selling on the street. Somebody sold bad meat. And what was that meat? Some bat in some cave bit some snake, and some snake was sold as meat, and, some, and the meat carried the virus. And the virus has gone around the world. 
is vicious, but it's also how nature works when we have imbalance. I mean, really, uh, America should have welcomed China to, to prosperity and partnered with it in civilizing the rest of the world. China was not a violent country. It had many problems around human rights, but it wasn't a militaristic country. It wasn't bombing people all the time or threatening war. We could, America and China should have been partnering. And that was what Obama was trying to do. And then when Trump came to power, it had to be a competition between nations and back again to the run up to World War I. And what happened during World War I? A bunch of soldiers, uh, uh, did not knowing what to do in Kansas, piled up a whole bunch of, found a whole bunch of animal uh, excrement, set it on fire, and that smoke carried the virus that became what we call, ironically, the Spanish flu. Actually, the it originated in uh, the same state as Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, it, 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 right in the center of America, where my father was born. Not Kansas, really, but Nebraska. It, it started in Nebraska, and it spread. The Spanish flu spread all over the world. And you know, why? If those soldiers hadn't been getting ready to go to war and in that overheated sense of getting World War I, and there hadn't been a World War I, there also wouldn't have been a Spanish flu until anyone will tell you World War I was an unnecessary war. And I think this trade war was unnecessary. And I think this, this extroversion that we've all been into has been very, very dangerous if we don't include as dear Dr. Jung told us, the introverted side. I mean, it's just, it's not hard to see, very hard to change, but if we don't compensate each and every one of us within ourselves, nature will take over and nature's compensations are not kind. They can't be, uh, it's, uh, they can't be. So I feel I'm atoning for my part in all this every day when I wake up in the middle of the night and allow myself to think from my belly and just hold my thoughts. They're not even thoughts. They're, they're ideas and feelings and just my standpoint emerges. It takes several hours in the middle of the night. Yet, ironically, I have energy to work with people all day. It's just because I took those hours and I'm able to hold their anxieties and hear them because I know how I feel. I know what I think. I could hardly put it into words. It's not something you can just share as a soundbite. I don't think I can tell you what I'm getting, but you're hearing some of the translation of the value and back to the earliest discovery of, of, of Jung that I would call a genuinely psychological discovery rather than simply a scientific discovery was that discovery that some there has to be room in the human race for introversion, it may look silly, it may look avoidant, or it may look pathological. Even to this day, psychiatry is trying to tell us that people with introvert or schizoid or the only healthy psyche is an extroverted psyche. There's actually a whole psychological uh, movement that says just that. I bet they had to fight hard, we Jungians, to keep the American Psychiatric Association twice for making introversion a personality disorder. And I, I recently had a role in 2013 in galvanizing all kinds of people, including our own International Association for Analytical Psychology and the International Association for Psychological Type and the Council of Northern American Societies of Young Analysts, all to bring some degree of pressure on the people working out the diagnostic code of the American Psychiatric Association, which were saying, well, introversion is not necessarily a personality disorder, but it should raise the index of suspicion of clinicians that a personality disorder exists where you see introversion. Imagine we have this virus with a respiratory attack. Imagine if, if pulmonary physicians were to say that inspiration, taking breath in, was pathological and only expiration was not. Could you imagine what lung, lung psychology would be like? We wouldn't have enough respirators to make up for that error. So here we are right now with the same problem. Do we really understand that if we don't stop and reflect, 
uh, we've already. Let me ask you a question here. I am reading again Susan Sontag, uh, illness as a metaphor, because you mentioned lungs. At some point, she's comparing tuberculosis with cancer. And she says that cancer is an illness of the body because you can locate it in the body very specifically. But she says, metaphorically, when the lungs get affected, become ill. Metaphorically, we're talking about an illness, a sickness of the soul. And I link these to what you said, compensation. I've been thinking about what is going on. We are, or we've been until lockdown, into what I call the last society, all you can eat society, the bulimic society. And now it's compensating because of too much entertainment, lust, unnecessary stuff into modesty, depth, maybe meditation, maybe more care. Or is this an illusion? Is this naive to hope that the compensation for too much extroversion hopefully will help us to look anew at different aspects such as modesty, depth, meditation and care. And I say this because I'm really puzzled when I see friends or I hear patients or I just look outside the window and I see people that are hyperactive, WhatsApp all day long, Skype, Zoom all day long, yoga online, yoga on YouTube, meditation on YouTube. I would say just as my very first therapist said, switch off all your technology and give yourself a rest. Slow down. Go with nature. Is this crisis a cry for go with nature instead of go for technology, money, speed? I, I, I don't think I'd say it that way, but I certainly understand why you are saying it that way. I, I think we all learned a lot from Susan Sontag. She was a brilliant person, and I had a number of friends who knew her personally. So she was someone that uh, was around from the, from the very beginning uh, of my development. And, and um, uh, it's kind of a, uh, once someone I know was on a plane next to her and handed her an article of mine and she seemed to like it. And I was rather pleased by that, although I never met her personally. So that was kind of a lovely thing. Um, and, uh, but the article she liked was an article called The Trickster in the Arts, which actually I, I'm happy going to be uh, sharing with you for a book you're putting together. And what I feel that she liked that is that she understood how tricky metaphor is. Uh, she, in fact, her work for her book, Ill Illness as Metaphor, is a warning against uh, using, using illness uh, naively as metaphor. Um, that does not mean that we who are human cannot draw and must not draw messages from what happens to us and imagine them. And so we are naturally metaphoric creatures. We just, but it was also uh, George Eliot who wa warned us of the, of the minds trapped by metaphors. One of our, our problems is that we sometimes um, in psychology imagine we can psychologize everything. What, what I would say is that tuberculosis, for example, the reason she was, she was complaining just as other people at the same time were complaining of the other great Victorian trope, which was the mad woman in the attic. And so there you have the image that the feminine had to be, uh, as in Jane Eyre, has to be a, a crazy woman up in the attic. And so that was where the feminine had gone in Victorian society. There's a lot to learn from that metaphor, but to, to literally believe that uh, 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 women can't take society and have to be confined somewhere is obviously a very dangerous myth. I was raised on Henry James, who loved George Eliot and, and the 19th century novelists and came from America like myself. 
and his one of his great novels is The Wings of the Dove, and the heroine is, a, is finer than normal person, and she's dying of tuberculosis. And it's amazing how the tuberculosis was romanticized and turned into almost the finest person, the more sensitive soul, and the finer, more generous soul is the one dying of, of tuberculosis. So when you get into tuberculosis, you get into, that was a horrible disease, but there's two or three things to learn from it. I was a med, as you know, I went to medical school. And one of the things that I learned in medical school was that the body in its, in its attempt to, to wall off the tubercle bacilli, the tubercle bacillus develops these enormous fibers, fibrotic, strong, inflammatory uh, reactions to save the lung from the invading bacterium. And what happens is that the people are dying of the fact that they can no longer breathe because the physical compensation, the immune response from within the body, the body's own way of protecting itself against the invading virus is, uh, in this case, tuber, not virus, but bacterium. It seemed to me that the compensation was worse than the disease itself. And I kept asking my professors, what would the body do if it didn't ward off, if it didn't wall off, if it didn't seal off, would the, would the tubercle bacilli themselves have caused just as much damage or would they have done it? Would, did the body need to do this? I never got a straight answer any more than I was ever able to find an exact definition. And James Holman had the same experience of psychosis. When I tried to write a book about evaluation and treatment, of the you can't get it. It's just a, it, that psychosis seems to not mean much more than too much. Uh, and so, but I did learn from the tuberculosis thing that sometimes uh, we're fascinated by a disease and we can sometimes think we have the answer in it because it's our way of understanding however metaphorically or dimly or unscientifically um, the violence of nature's compensations and the degree to which we have to heed that. So if you could take the old, old idea that the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord and you add to that Wittgenstein, of that which we know nothing, we should not speak. I cannot answer the mystery. All I can say is that I know nature compensates and when i see a compensation i kind of say how did how did this happen you know the way we do in in in, in, in medicine if, if as a psychiatrist if a patient commits suicide very often we have a psychological autopsy how did it happen how did this develop it's a kind of collective work of mourning how did this happen sat in such a meeting where uh, a young doctor had checked himself into uh, the hospital uh, with the secret aim of killing himself and did so. He was actually someone who had HIV. And of course, we went through that and, and through AIDS in, in, in San Francisco. And so we all, including myself, were at his, his, his that psychological psychological autopsy and tried to put together how this man, what he had done. And he was kind of a saint and he, had, he didn't want to burden anybody with his, his death and his dead body. And so he had found this way of, of ending his life in as clean a way as he knew how to do. It was extraordinarily moving. But when one could put that together, we, we had a little bit of peace because it was very hard to lose him. But at the same time, he was looking forward to a very painful and ugly death, and he just did not want to inflict that on others. It was the kind of person he was. And so we had to see that. He was an angel in America. He really was. And so was Tony Kushner wrong to write a play in which he spoke of AIDS victims, angels in America? Well, I saw that man. He was an angel in America. So the metaphors help us if we don't pretend we know anything. I think that's where Susan Sontag's skepticism about 
grabbing onto it and say, it's this. The thing about a metaphor is it's a comparison without the use of like or as. Um, and it, it works to organize one's fantasy and perhaps get just a glimmer of meaning. But it, we, we have to think of that meaning as the beginning of a dialogue uh, rather than the end of it. If it closes off the dialogue and say, and we turned this all into the last judgment. What do you expect? You people have been doing everything wrong. No wonder you're getting, you know, no wonder you're getting your comeuppance now. It will, good God. I mean, we saw that done with the HIV. And if we do that with coronavirus, but the way I look at it, most of those victims are victims. Doctors who were treating them were heroes and doctors who are treating coronavirus are heroes. We know that. People with the coronavirus are victims, but let's remember the victims are also heroes and the doctors are also victims. In other words, let's not break, let's not turn one of us into the wounded and the other in, sentimentally into the heroes. Let's 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 keep the let's keep the lines open. Um, we're all we're all in this dialectic between something perhaps heroic and something perhaps victim oriented something it, 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 there's a, something about illness and health are themselves part of what you have to live as a person i mean as a doctor i can't live as a doctor if i don't know my own wounds I, and i have to look i have to wash them every day to be able to help others. Hillman said it so beautifully about the wounded healer. The wound that does not heal becomes a well of cures. But the minute I think I'm not wounded and I just take care of the wounded, I, I'm probably the most dangerous doctor that can be because I need more and more victims and I don't want to celebrate victims. I want to remember we're all victims and we're all heroes. We're all in it together. And illness is a great misfortune. And of course, it's compensatory to something in the body and the soul that is out of out of whack. And of course, that's a mystery we have to live rather than simply glibly identify and move on. So we have we have the work to do of holding. And that's and we have the work to do of contemplating. Contemplating. Would you like to know how I got to these thoughts this year? Beyond metaphors, we are in lockdown, partial or full. Perhaps in two weeks, one month, we will be released. Hey. What is your fantasy? What is, I hope so too, but what is your fantasy? I heard today on the BBC on my way to my praxis, three million people in the US last week applied to the employment agency. So there is going to be a gigantic economical financial crisis, much worse than 2008, because this happened within two weeks. Well, and exactly. okay. well, there it is. It's all very well to prate, as I might be have it done already. And if I do, I apologize to anyone who's offended about logical extroversion. But I have to tell you that unemployment is one of the most tragic situations ever. Um, years ago, years ago, there was a movie that I loved very much and talked about all over the Jungian world for a long, long time. I still see it as one of the greatest scripts ever. It's a movie called Broadcast News that uh, uh, has a scene in which a particular office is being downsized and people are learning that they, that they cannot work anymore because they that there was a budgetary crisis. This was not anything like what we have now. And the enormous feeling of failure, of sadness. Of course, both of my parents were children of the Depression and both of them very, very poor uh, at, at that time. And the Great Depression in America was very real for them. So I grew up hearing about all of 
that. So this, there are many people who for a long time in America and other places, partly because the prices go up with this extroversion and the more people who are affluent, the more the prices for everything are set to the people who can pay them. So many people have been living only from paycheck to paycheck. And so they've been just barely hanging on. Many people working two and even three jobs just yeah. to keep things going. And many families in America, and this is something that has been hitting me very hard because I've been in denial at one level of it. When I first heard children, uh, the schools were closing, I was thinking about, well, the kids will be home, but that will be nice. And then I heard, where, the, where was my head? I should have known this viscerally and completely. The problem was that for the many of these children, it was a disaster for the parents to have them because they were depending on the school lunch to feed their children. The school lunch was the only meal their children had. I found out from my godson, who's a naturopath in, uh, in Seattle, that it's over 50% of the children in Seattle, the parents are depending on the school lunch. And I thought of Seattle as an affluent. Now, maybe I'm misquoting him, and, and I hope I'm not, but it was something like that. The, the figures are incredibly high. These are things that a, a so-called affluent culture disguises. It, it covers over the degree to which to maintain appearances so that some schools were giving breakfast as well as lunch. The children, the parent, so, they now they're trying to figure out how to give the lunch to the to the child so they're figuring out ways to give it but if they were to deliver the lunch to the home then the whole hungry family would be in the dilemma of does the child get the lunch or does the whole family eat the lunch because nobody's eating three meals a day some are not eating one meal a day i have worked with people who confessed to me that they were eating every other day so it's you know i've never missed a meal in my life i think but there are people you have and do it daily. And so when you take away even one month of employment with someone who's living paycheck to paycheck, that person is in the midst of a disaster. We've just passed a $2 trillion bailout for people that will solve certain problems for some people for a certain amount of time in America. But uh, looks like it's going to go through. But actually, it would take five trillion dollars to produce any kind of real security for people. So this is a this is so then the question is, is it even ethical to ask people to stay at home? That raises the whole other issue. Of course, it seems to prevent the spread of the virus, and that seems to be good and not to overwhelm the health system, but that's just one piece. There are whole other pieces. Maybe history will, will say that the depression that results had more. So again, is our effort to compensate going to create yet another compensation? And so we get into this cycle of violent swings between opposites. So what we're going to need to do is find a way, and that's what I do every night, how today can I hold the opposites between action and inaction, extroversion, introversion, uh, pulling back from society and going even more towards society? Uh, <clears throat> if I were to keep my distance from the problem, there would be something very awful about that. Psychologically, I have to get closer to it, even as I may physically have to protect myself from it. And we have to think about every consequence of every act we take. This seems to be the brutal lesson of this time, to take it all on. Levinas said, you know, we have an infinite obligation to the other. That means it's not finite. We can't say, well, we'll do this because that's, that's we're going to do this now because, well, what will happen to the people who, who get up, who lose their work? We'll leave that aside for now. Right now, we just have to prevent. No, you can't do that. You have to think of, we have to think of that too. And it's not just that we have an infinite responsibility to the other, each of us, but there are an infinite number of others. All those others, they're, everything we talk about, there's another. 
if we practice the idea that everything affects the whole and the whole affects us in every way and we take all of it on i honestly do not think that we go crazy because because of the complexity i think our consciousness rises to the occasion it's only when we take one strand and think we've got it that we get in trouble so this is going to put a demand on all of us to get to the level of self that just listens to all of it and there is something in us that can do that that's what i wait that's what i wake up to spend my time with and i think it's in all of us it's not something you have to be a Jungian analyst to know you just have to leave your ego and it's lovely wish to turn everything into easy polarities aside and then just get into surely surely this is an opportunity to do that this crisis is an opportunity to do that that we have the famous danger and opportunity the opportunity is certainly an opportunity to reflect and when we start thinking about the effect of this on everything a lot of those other decisions we seem to be unable to make about the climate and about wars and about ethnic cleansings and all these different things and about uh, this income disparity between peoples that create these problems. Surely we can develop a greater capacity to move beyond the naive oppositions and, and get into the, to the ability that we all have to be to be conscious of all of it I, every time i do that i seem to have to be more effective in, in the little role i have and but not so little for the people who see it in helping people hold their lives together i do that all the time and, and i the little sample i have of myself and the others that i help only works when we take all of it into account all of it thank you john